Uh, I'm in my first year at the uh, Inte artificial intelligence uh, master from uh, Babesh Boye. Um, so this presentation was taught uh, in the following way. I'm going to present the problem, give a brief introduction and motivation. Uh, start with my research questions, then go to colorization patterns and models, discuss the results that we can obtain out of these models, and then jump to conclusions and future work. So, um, in terms of what is colorization, uh, it's something that children are inherently good at. And as we grow up, we can be on either of these two lines. We can be artists and know how to add color within the lines, or we can be the other people that don't know how painting, painting works. So here is the learning curve for uh, colorization. This problem is not one that has no solution. There are people that are doing colorization by hand, adding color to pictures that are monochromatic. But we would like to have something that uh, in some ways automates the process. The photography colorization, as a quick introductory, introductory definition in our context, is the task of artificially reconstructing color information in pictures that has never been captured on a storage medium capable of recording color. So you can imagine your old photos in black and white. Those are the main uh, example. A great book that you can uh, search on the internet and uh, take a look at how people are doing this is The Paper Time Machine by Wolfgang Wild and uh, Jordan Lloyd. Jordan Lloyd is one of the artists that are influencing this uh, area and he's uh, doing everything that you see in this picture by hand. So this picture was taken in black and white uh, and uh, what you see is his work. So while deep learning algorithms are predicting the chromaticity, the color through either discriminative or generative learning, artists such as those from Dynamic Chrome are closing the gap through manually reconstructing the layers which often take intuition. Um, in this problem, fooling the human perception of truth is the main goal uh, of any method. So either I am doing the colorization or I employ a deep learning algorithm. The idea is to fool someone. It's not to recreate the colors that were there originally because monochromatic areas may have multiple plausible colorization. And this is a tough problem to solve. Before dealing with the implementation and the solutions, we need to know how we need the pictures to be in order to work with them. Um, we need to start from the luminosity channel that we are often calling black and white pictures. And we want to employ a deep learning algorithm to predict two channels that store colors. Uh, usually images on our phones are stored as RGBs and they are not quite useful for us because uh, we should somehow map a red image to the green and blue channels or something like that, not really useful. Um, in the end, once we have the two chromaticity channels or the channels that are storing color, we are stacking them together and obtaining the final result. Why would someone invest in colorization? Uh, besides from arts, there are implications in medicine where we can improve the user interfaces for diagnostic purposes. In communication, we can compress the image because uh, three layers are not really needed if we predict two of them. In games, we can render photorealistic scenes. And in computational intelligence, we can help the topic back by being a proxy task. A proxy task is, it goes as, um, as this. Uh, so while I'm, I'm learning something, I'm helping another task to learn better his part. So somehow I'm, um, I'm putting there something for another task to, be, to improve. Uh, in arts, there are lots of people that would pay for colorization because there are a lot of movies, um, old movies that could be uh, restored, comics and legacy photography. 
In terms of timing, um, since 1920, uh, the world received the possibility to take pictures in color with batches of film like Kodak or so. Um, then in 1975, the first digital camera uh, was available and we could take pictures uh, and store them as digital files. And only after 1988, colorization attempts begin to arise. And since then, only between 2002 and 2021, deep learning methods were employed. Um, the methods that I'm thinking about and most interested into are those between 2016 and 2021, because they are the most um, impressive ones between 2002 and 2014 there were methods that heavily relied on um, the user to guide the algorithm and so on so those are the nice uh, implementations in terms of, of what um, they return to us um, the timing is quite right for uh, someone if uh, he or she wants to enter the scene because there are quite a few papers and uh, the work in this area can have various um, like incentives. Our research questions are as follow. What patterns are usually used and what models? Uh, what are the implications of convolutional neural networks in this task and how well would, would these uh, methods perform in professional applications? So we have patterns. Patterns are kind of a way of thinking when you want to approach this task. So you need a um, mindset, then you can employ the um, deep learning algorithms as you want. These patterns are usually concerned about how you get your data. So there are two of them, um, data-driven colorization. In the early iterations, um, people relied on uh, human intervention, intervention to uh, make the colorization possible. And that wasn't really what most of them wanted. Uh, and they started to leverage large-scale large data sets and the performance of newly invented GPUs to make the process fully automatic. But if you make the process fully automated, then you lose the human preference. And as we all know, we want to express our preferences in whatever we do. So there are human in the loop colorization patterns. These patterns are not really automatic um, up to the last level. You can have some input. And how can you give this input by textual descriptions, color hints, and reference color images? Let's see how those work. So you can think about legacy photography. Your grandma has some pictures. And on the back of those pictures, you have some uh, notes. There, there was a sunny day, uh, or there, there was a rainy day, or something happened. And you might infer some colors from there. Then on social media, we are often encouraged to describe our images, to say something about them, and that something might have some clues about what's going on. So you can imagine hashtag golden hour, everything is warm, everything is shiny. Um, the idea builds on top of the fact that colors are associated with complex semantic concepts. And these concepts usually uh, are as um, something like this. If you, if you associate red with danger, then you are, uh, you are quite normal. Most people do that. Uh, the problem is that it's language specific. So if you associate a color with a sentiment, then most probably it's because you are influenced by a language, English or Slavic uh, languages. But uh, languages differ in terms in terms of how many basic colors they have. So some languages uh, have only three basic colors, red, dark, or yeah, you know, black, and uh, white or bright. Imagine that you have to explain to someone that you saw a scene with only three colors. It's, it's quite hard. Imagine that you have to colorize something using those colors. Um, 
Good. So in terms of uh, the networks behind those, uh, we want to join textual and visual uh, features. We'll see later what these features are, but we want to somehow join vectors of textual description with uh, vectors or tensors of visual descriptors and by combining them uh, to somehow recreate those colors. Here is a balance, a fine balance between image segmentation and a fusion module. The image segmentation deals with extracting features, um, textual features from, from images or define what's in that image. For example, you give it an image and uh, you get back something like there's a dog and a cat and they do that and so on. Uh, the fusion module is the part that combines this uh, these, uh, this information. So it's a balance between uh, understanding what's in the image and fusing the features. Um, when dealing with text, we have a lot of parameters and that's a problem. We have to somehow make uh, the use of parameters work in efficient ways. And one of those ways is applying feature-wise linear modulation. Then, based on color hints, it's quite easy. We can imagine how it works. Uh, you are selecting some points um, on a user interface. And after that, the model uh, in real time deals with your preference. I selected a really weird preference for a pink dress and the blue background. You can see what's going on. You can reset everything and uh, make it look professional. Another way to express your preferences is by giving either histograms, um, kind of uh, color palettes, like I want these, these colors, like when you're deciding how your walls in the house will look like. Um, and yeah, those are given the model uh, knows how to deal with them. It's important to know that you have a lot of options in terms of color hints. So you can give the algorithms hints in a number of ways. Based on color references, this is a funny one uh, because uh, the first example is that imagine you are giving a algorithm, a picture of a cherry blossom or some tree with uh, pink leaves and you ask it to transfer the colors to a picture you took on the Californian West Coast. And it makes the waves uh, pink. And yeah, God knows what else is going to be weird in that image. But that's the idea. It's transferring features, those tensors, vectors, however you want to call them. It's transferring them from one image to the other image. It works quite well. Imagine the nice case when, where you have a red Honda and uh, you have the red Honda in your garden and you, are, you want to color a bus that it's in black and white. So uh, the bus will become red because you are giving uh, the algorithm a red Honda as an example. The method allows for multimodal colorization. So the idea is that something doesn't have a color and that's it you can give it a blue Honda, a gray, a gray a Hyundai, and so on. Uh, the user may provide these images or these images can be obtained. Um, you can give the gray scale image and some, uh, some algorithms will say, um, okay, this is the most appropriate image. I think uh, use it or don't, it's up to you. Now, going in the deep part of the presentation. Um, I want to explain to those that are not um, often working with uh, convolutional neural networks, where are they situated? So you have the entire artificial intelligence domain, then you want to deal with specific tasks that uh, ask of you to map something to something else and solve your problem. That's machine learning. Then you have deep learning, the problem gets really complicated. It's not that easy to map those things. And then you have convolutional neural networks where the job is really specific. So the network most important part is the convolutional layer. 
of the convolutional layers as the architecture get deeper and deeper uh, gets deeper and deeper um, it's made up of convolutional filters which are uh, also called kernels but imagine that those filters are obtaining the features that we talked about up to this point so by some mathematical procedure i can obtain features these features although are some numbers they represent things like parts of the face, uh, maybe a more abstract concepts and so on. Now, um, these features are not always uh, obtained from images. As you saw, they can be obtained from text. And the end goal is to compress everything and to boil it down into something simple and with which we can work. Boiling it down is the job of an encoder. So you have an encoder decoder architecture with a middle layer that's a fusion module. What's the fusion module used for? Is used for uh, combining multiple features into one block. That block is usually really small. Then by upsampling, that block will uh, reach back the original size of the image and the two layers of color that we obtain out of them will be combined with the initial one and you get the colorized picture. Some important things are as follow. You have to keep the image ratio preserved. You cannot modify the image ratio uh, and you can do that by padding and you must avoid at all costs distortions. Um, those can be avoided using stride instead of pulling. Now, the more complicated stuff. Um, we want to extract low, middle, and global features. What would that mean? It means that some features are more precise than others. So, for example, imagine you want to colorize a portrait or something really delicate with lots of details. Those are low features. The high features are things like you have the sky, you have the road, and you want to make sure that those are uh, colorized in the right way. So you have to keep all these things in balance. Keep in mind you have only one model that deals with both portraits and roads. So it's complicated to keep them in line. Uh, predictions are not only, always deterministic, but sometimes are probabilistic. It's like this. Uh, instead of trying to predict one color that works for that particular uh, piece of image, you might get better results if you are predicting um, kind of color distributions. So let's say some part of the image might be yellow, but might be uh, green. And whether it is one or the other is decided also by uh, what's in the vicinity. So you can approach things one way or the other. The discriminative models are those that are kind of uh, trying to classify what that piece of uh, monochromatic image might be. So this is definitely yellow, red, green, whatever I was trained for. In the generative models, I'm not training the model to discriminate between colors, but learn how to produce a color. So you can imagine those RGB numbers that you sometimes maybe so in the past, um, instead of trying to uh, ask the model which one, I'm asking, okay, how would you like to produce it? How, how are you producing it? Oh, so I'm putting this, 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 and this. Oh, okay, great, I see. Um, so discriminative tries to find the right one, generative produces one. Uh, the discriminative ones are VGG and UNET, and one that I would suggest people to look into in the generative world is the pix pixel convolutional neural network. End-to-end -end learning is often used because it reduces a lot of bad stuff that you want to avoid, like bias, artifacts, and hand-designed components. Often people are using Humber loss and L2, uh, and the open problems are that the guesses are conservative. Let's make everything brown just because it minimizes the loss. Um, lack of color normalization. I saw pictures of blue sky with yellow parts, but of, of such a yellow that I 
guess never in the history of the world the sky wasn't that color. Um, there is color bleeding, some color extends way outside of the border, and small objects are ignored. We can imagine that. There is very little research in this area since early 80s, only 85 papers or so. Humans are quite good at, good at not being fooled by these algorithms. And we wonder if we can reproduce the results on a data set we um, curated. These are the results, a lot of data. You are a human being. You cannot really digest all that data. But let me explain to you what's uh, describing. Uh, it's describing the type of images that you are um, or it's recommended to use with each model. So some models gain better performance and at some types of images, other at other types. Now, let's see some images. This is one of the best models. On the lower side, you have the grayscale scale images. On the middle, you have the colorized version. And on the top, you have the ground truth. So while objects are often missed, I mean, in my opinion, the screwdriver is always red, but the model doesn't know that. Uh, and this piece of fabric, it's blue, but I mean, it, it, the model doesn't give much importance to that blue. Um, portraits are often well colorized uh, spaces where uh, nature is often encountered. Also, they're, uh, they're well managed. Uh, the sky is well managed, but we can expect that, at least that. Um, one problem that I often see is that uh, it gets excited uh, and um, sometimes it forgets to color uh, flowers with actual colors and not green. Um, but yeah, that's, that's that. In terms of metrics, there are some metrics uh, really specific to this task. Uh, the peak signal to noise ratio, uh, the structural similarity index measure, and the learned perceptual image patch similarity quite complicated names, I know. Something that is more um, appealing to us is the Turing test, where you ask a human, do you think that this image came out of a colorization model or it was taken by a camera? Now, one of the metrics that uh, is really nice, in my opinion, is the LPIPS, the Learn Perceptual Image Patch Similarity which uses deep network activations to um, check the similarity between two images, works surprisingly well, and it, it comes closer to the uh, preference in ranking that human express. In general, those metrics account for luminosity, uh, contrast, structural dis distortion, sharpness, and colorfulness. Now, um, these algorithms aren't always reliable because only a few of them are available online or still available. They were once available, but now they uh, are not um, there. Uh, the setup and the hardware requirements are quite challenging for this task. GitHub repository are not often well-maintained, but besides all of these, these methods can be uh, used in professional applications. And one of these papers was included in Photoshop Elements 2020. The whole work was uh, thought of as setting the grounds for further colorization initiatives. And our future work includes uh, extending the experimental evaluation, contributing on making these models more accessible to the uh, general public, and improving on the existing uh, convolutional neural network-based approaches. So with this, I'm reaching the end of the presentation. Uh, I hope you learned something new.